Welcome and thank you for joining me, Dr. Jason W. Morrison, Theologist, New South Wales, Australia, doing a theological audit on a Jehovah Witnessism weekend meeting for the 8th of February 2020. A theological audit is when you check the theology of the speaker to see if it lines up with an unbiased theology of the New Testament. He's come to Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13 and has gone the conclusion of the matter. Everything has, having been heard is fear the true God, which we went over in the last um, audit, and keep his commandments, which we had to say it's not Mosaic commandments, it's the, um, the commandment, the new commandment, the New Testament commandment, which is to love your neighbor as yourself. It has nothing to do with Jehovah. It's about humanity and humaneness. That's what Jesus asked for. And then they're threatened, for the true God will judge every deed, including everything as to whether it is good or bad. Well, that might be true and it sounds scary, but for the believer, let's just sort this out. <clears throat> um, Christ was judged at the, at the cross. That's judgment number one, ascended, sent down the Holy Spirit. The believer's body at death goes to the ground. Their soul is ushered by their spirit into the presence of Christ. Now, there's going to be a time when all the dead in Christ will be risen to the parousia, which is the judgment seat of Christ. Those that are alive will be caught up to meet them in the air. This is a second judgment, and this is a judgment of reward, not a punishment. The believer's judgment was at the cross, when Christ was crucified and punished at the cross with God's wrath for the penalty of sin and for sin to be taken away. So when you go to the judgment seat of Christ, it is not a judgment of punishment. It's a judgment of reward and comfort. Third judgment, Israel, the Jews in the tribulation, great tribulation period culminating in Armageddon, where Christ's second appearing, physical appearing on earth, will occur as he saves the nation of Israel from the nations that are just about ready to destroy it because the allies won't be able to stop the nations that are trying to destroy it. Christ will come himself and annihilate the nations. Judgment number four, and then judgment number five, is the one which so many Christians think they're going to, but it's got nothing to do with them. And that's a Christian judgment there. The Great White Throne Judgment, which has nothing to do with the Christians, um, which is also called the Second Resurrection and the Second Death, which, of course, those who don't get through this one will spend in the Lake of Fire. So there's a lot to know and a lot to learn, but these people just handpick scriptures to suit their agenda let's see what else this guy's got to say so, so this, this fear, fear of god, god what, what really is, is it? How, how do we, we develop, develop it, it? What what seven seven oh this is going to be awesome i got to see this because the fear of the fear of god was manifest when christ was crucified and the wrath of god was poured out on him that's about as bad as the fear of god can get Let's see what this guy's going to say. This is theological abuse viewers at its best. Benefits that come from fearing the true God. God. And why do we need to keep God's commandments? So that's just a preview of what we're going to talk about. Oh my gosh, if he's talking about the Mosaic commandments, this is severe theological abuse. This could be our worst audit yet. <laughs> I'm trying to get good results for these people, but you can't. You just can't. Today. But this fear of God... It's, it's something, something that all Christians, Christians need to understand, to understand because, because with this fear of God, this is going to help us in reference to our salvation. So, so let's, let's give a simple, simple definition of what that In reference to our salvation? <laughs> oh dear, hang on a minute. We've got to go to the Bible Gateway. It's a good tool, the Bible Gateway. And we'll just type in the fear of the Lord. Uh, we'll put it in italics. Hang on a sec. The fear of the Lord. And uh, we'll just have this for safekeeping. We'll go to... What's this one in Acts? Let's just see. 
Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they are multiplied. What do you think the fear of the Lord is? The fear of the Lord is walking in what the Lord Jesus Christ has given us at the cross and to be humane. Words like comfort and multiplied, peace and edified are associated with the fear of the Lord. So let's just see what happens here. The fear of God is taken from one of our references means this. It says it is a feeling Christians should have toward their maker. One definition of this fear is an awe and a profound reverence for the creator and a wholesome dread of displeasing him. Thus, this fear of God influences two aspects of our lives. Attitude toward God and attitude toward the conduct that he hates. So let's just break that down. So that's one way of looking at it, but it's not the right way of looking at it. If you really fear the Lord, you turn to Christ. You turn to the finished work of Christ, you bow down at the cross, and you say, Lord, I have nothing. I have nothing except to surrender to what the Lord Jesus Christ has done on the cross. I believe. Fill me with your spirit. Guide me by your spirit. Teach me by your spirit. I surrender to you. Thank you, Lord conduct and all the rest of it isn't going to add to anything when you come before God. The only approach we have to God is in Christ. Christ is the fear of the Lord. So you have our attitude to him. But what is our attitude to him? Well, we love Jehovah God. We love everything he's done for us. So because we love him... No, no, no. I've got... Hang on. I've got this in the wrong... Sorry, viewers. I've... Oh, dear. Anyway, we'll continue on. What is the attitude to a kind that we hate? Well, if you want to please someone and you learn about the things that offend him, we stay away from things that offend him. So we can say that when it comes to conduct that God hates, we avoid it. Now, putting it all together, when someone fears the true God, that he hates. What this guy's got to realize so is that even the world has moral. He's talking about morals. Okay, religious moral sociological moral um, approaching God's got nothing to do with moral I'm sorry it just hasn't I know it sounds paradoxical and wrong but you don't need religion to have moral there's no high form of some super duper form of moral but this is a religious super duper look at me look at my morals I know people in the world that leave many of these Christian people for dead when it comes to moral. To him. But what is our attitude to him? Well, we love Jehovah God. We love everything he's done for us. So because we love him, what is the attitude to a conduct that we hate? Well, if you want to please someone and you learn about the things that offend him, we stay away from things that offend him. Now, without faith, the Bible says it's impossible to please God. Hebrews 11.6. It doesn't say without moral. It says without faith. Now this makes the hair on the back of a lot of religious people's necks stand up because they say, oh no, it's about how good you are and it's about what you've done and what you haven't. No, it's not. It's about faith in Christ. Without faith in Christ, it's impossible to please God. So we can say that when it comes to conduct that God hates, we avoid it. Now, putting it all together, when someone fears... Now, what does God hate? He hates sin. Okay, he wants to get to the root of sin. If you get to the root, you can help with the fruit. And he done that when Christ died on the cross. No mention of the Lord Jesus Christ at all so far. True God is like this. Because we love him and we don't want to displease him, we don't want to do anything that he hates. Simply put. Now, this fear of, true, fear of God is demonstrated in a certain way. How do we demonstrate this fear of God? How do we prove that we have it? Well, a Christian would demonstrate that he has the fear of God by avoiding works of the flesh, things that he hates. Honda. Now, what are the works of the flesh? This is my favorite subject. Um, let's go to, we can use jw.org. Can I get the Bible online? Yep. We'll go to Galatians. 
And this is something that a lot of these cult people and many Christians as well don't understand what the works of the flesh is. Um, now, the whole context of Galatians is Paul trying to help the Jewish believers in Galatia to understand that they can transition their psyche away from thinking that they need the law for salvation, get rid of that, and put your faith in Christ where you'll be free. <clears throat> so we'll just start in, I want to do this quick, verse 5. Chapter 5, verse 1. For such freedom Christ set us free. That's freedom from the Mosaic law, from the things we think we need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad because it causes sin. Therefore stand firm and do not let yourselves be confined again in a yoke of slavery. What was the yoke of slavery? It was relative to the Mosaic law, which is easily defined, the thing as the things we think we need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. See, I, Paul, I am telling you that if you become circumcised, what's circumcised? It was something they thought they needed to do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. It's so simple. Christ will be of no benefit to you. Christ is no benefit to anybody that thinks there's something they need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. I can't simplify this any more than that. Again, I bear witness to every man who gets some... Look, every person that thinks there's something they need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad is under the obligation to keep the whole law, not some of it, but the whole lot of it. Can you see the argument? You are separated from Christ. You who are trying to be declared righteous by means of the things you think you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. Now, many of you that have followed me and this channel, this would be starting to become very clear to you. And this is the danger of why there's so much religious evil. Because as soon as you think that you can be declared, be declared righteous by the things you think you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad, you're separating yourself from Christ in the sense that you're not walking in the Holy Spirit. For you have fallen away from his undeserved kindness and you and whilst you might think you're under it, his undeserved kindness, well you'll be you'll say be saved by it, but you're not walking in it. You're walking in a way in which you're trying to be declared be declared righteous by God by the things you think you need to do or not do to make God happy, or stop him from being sad. This is the whole argument of Galatians and most of Romans. For our part we are by spirit. Now, if you don't think you've got a spirit, I've got news for you, and so is the New World Translation. Eagerly waiting for the hope, the hope for righteousness resulting from faith. What is the hope for righteousness? Many of you don't know. what They think it's the paradise. It's not. It's the parousia. It's the coming of Christ to the clouds. 1 Thessalonians 4. 16 and on. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye at the sound of the last trump. For the trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ will rise. Then those who are alive shall be caught up to meet them in the air. That's the another word for its rapture, but rapture, the word itself, is not in the Bible. And people use that as an excuse to think that it's not going to happen, but it is. That's our hope the hope of meeting Christ in the air. For in union with Christ Jesus, neither what we think we need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad is of no value, but faith operating through love. What's that? That's the New Testament commandment given by Christ to be humane, to love one another. You were running well. Who hindered you from continuing to obey the truth? What was the truth? The truth was the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ and faith in that has, for time and eternity, once and for all, settled all our issues between ourselves and God for time and eternity, as I said, never to be worried about again. That's the truth. All this other truth is nonsense. The truth centralized around the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
this sort of persuasion, these are the legalists, these are the ones that are telling people there's something you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad, um, does not come from the one calling you. A little leaven ferments the whole batch of dough. I am confident that you who are in union with the Lord, now the Lord there is the Lord Jesus Christ, will not come to think otherwise. But the one who is causing you trouble, whoever he may be, will receive the judgment he deserves. For as, as for me, brothers, if I am still preaching circumcision, which he wasn't, Mosaic law, no, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the stumbling block of the torture stake, they use torture stake, but it's actually cross, has been eliminated. I wish men who are trying to unsettle, the men who are trying to unsettle you would emasculate themselves, would remove themselves. And there's reason for this. You were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use this freedom as an opportunity to pursue fleshly desires. Now, that's twofold in the one sense. Don't think that because you're free, you can make up rules for righteousness. Don't think that because you're free, you can, you know, go out and harm people or yourself. But through love, serve for one another. They got slave for it. It says serve one another. For the entire law has been fulfilled in one commandment, namely. Now, I'm surprised they haven't tried to botch this and put, you should love the Lord God Jehovah with all your mind and with all your heart. That's not what the Bible's asking for. The Bible's asking for, you must love your neighbour as yourself. See how when you get the foundation right, it all ties in together. You're protected from this nonsense. If, though, you keep on biting and devouring one another, look out that you do not get annihilated by one another, which is happening a lot in Christendom today. But I say, keep walking by the Spirit. This is actually the Holy Spirit, and they haven't put the deity on that, and you will carry out no fleshly desire at all. So if you're walking in and knowing that the finished work of Christ is enough and you can get on with your life, you will not be fulfilling the desire of the flesh. For the flesh is against the spirit in its desire, and the spirit against the flesh. These are opposed to each other, so that you do not do the things you want to do. In other words, if you are under the law, you'll do things of sin. If you're walking by the spirit, it will help you to stay away from sin. Furthermore, if you are led, being led by the spirit, you are not under the law. So there's two mutually exclusive groups, the legalists and the people that knew of the finished work of Christ. This is what the legalists can look forward to. Now, the works of the flesh, which is what this guy is talking about, and the reasons why they are there, the works of the things, the results of the things we think we need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad, are plainly seen. And this is why there's so much wickedness in religion. And they are sexual immorality, uncleanness, brazen conduct. You can put in here child molestation, idolatry, spiritism, hostility, strife, jealousy, fits of rage, dissensions, divisions, sex. This is a sect. Envy, drunkenness, wild parties and things like these. I am forewarning you about these things the same way I already warned you that those who practice such things will not inherit God's kingdom they will not be living in, they should, will not be living the life that they should be now. Because on the other hand, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, kindness, patience, goodness, faith, mildness and self-control, of course, which against such things there is nothing we need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad because Christ has nailed to the cross the flesh together with its passions and desires. So if you are living by the Holy Spirit, let us also go on walking orderly by the Holy Spirit. Let us not become egotistical, stirring up competition with one another, envy and another. This is all this. So as soon as you think there's something you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad, alongside of or exclusive to the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're in very serious trouble. That baby hates. 
Let's see an example of conduct that Jehovah hates. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. Right. So he's gone to where I've got you, but I bet she doesn't put it in context. Remember, this behavior, these things that he's about to read, are a result of thinking that there's something you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. It's actually a result of you having good intentions to please God, but in the wrong way. Because the only way we can please God is to have faith in Christ. Beyond that, there's nothing else we can offer him. Our righteousness is as filthy rags, as I warned. But they have no clue of this. They have no clue of the danger of thinking you can impress Jehovah by what you do or don't do. And the danger associated with it is the reason why there's so much trouble in the church, churches worldwide. Now here the Apostle Paul was helping the congregation that was, you can say, struggling with vices that God hates. So it's interesting when he gives us... Now the reason why that was... Why, what was the reason? They were struggling with these vices viewers because they thought there was things they needed to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. They were walking in the flesh. They were walking by the things they thought they could do to impress God or not do to impress God. I know it sounds so simple and trivial, but it's major. This is why there is so much evil in these organizations because they're running around with all good intention trying so hard to impress God who really doesn't care less. And the power that your sinful nature needs is this type of sinful behavior, thinking that there's something you can do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. To him, it's not the first time he told him about this, which shows the struggle that they have when it comes to fearing God. But for the simple fact of knowing that a person who fears God refrains from works of the flesh, Notice what Paul says. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. He says, now the works of the flesh are plainly seen. Now they're taking the works of the flesh as the things you do wrong. They're not taking it as the things we think we need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. Can you see this? 99.9% .9 of Christians think this is our innate ability to do wrong but the truth of the matter is this is wrong produced by good intention to make god happy or stop him from being sad this is horrible theology this is just hand-picked nonsense theology and they are sexual immorality uncleanness brazen now let me just say sexual immorality has to include child sexual abuse which is rampant in this organization and so is um, swapping of partners and all the rest of it. Idolatry, spiritism, hostility, strife. Let me just say too, idolatry in this case is idolatry of the watchtower and its um, governing body. All of this stuff, hostility, shunning, strife, just jealousy amongst the elders and anger. All this stuff comes out of thinking there's something you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. Life, jealousy, fits of anger, dissensions, divisions, sects, envy, drunkenness. Well, they're in a sect, aren't they? Wild parties and things like these. I am forewarning you about these things the same way I already warned you that those who practice such things will not inherit God's kingdom. What a threatening well, way of putting it. Well, don't take the rocket scientist to see what God hates. That's why it says plainly seen. And this will not inherit God's kingdom is present tense, not future tense. You're not living in the blessing. You've separated yourself from Christ while you're alive. You'll still be saved because you're saved by faith. You'll still go to the judgment seat of Christ. Many would argue that, but you have to. You have to be allowed in by faith in Christ. Despite all this, that's how forgiveness works. That's how the cross works. I know it sounds unfair, but that's just how it works. So don't allow this scripture to intimidate you into thinking, oh my God, I've got so much I need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. That's not it at all. 
This is actually coming out of that attitude. You've got to surrender to Christ and just allow his spirit to lead you and guide you and get on with your life. Leave a lot of this religious, um, these religious platitudes behind. He's talking to Christians, people that know Jehovah's, what, what, what offends Jehovah God. So he was reminding them, these are things that can bar you from getting into God's new kingdom. That's how serious it was. It basically means your life is at stake. But here's, here's the thing when it comes back to fear of God. You see, when someone who fears Jehovah God, he's not like a robot. He doesn't just obey just because he's told. Remember, the attitude toward God is that he loves him. So when you love someone, you're thinking about things that please him. You don't oh, need a dear. list of rules, 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 and regulations. Well, I have to argue, this is starting to get confusing, isn't it? Starting to get confusing. On the one hand, you've got to live up to a standard. On the other hand, you're not a robot and there's not a list of things. There's been no mention of faith in Christ, which is the answer to all this. So let's see where this ends up. This is theological abuse, ladies and gentlemen, because it's playing with the psyche of these people religiously. That's why Apostle Paul says, said things like these. In other words, I'm just giving you like a sketch and you can build from there and see what other things Jehovah doesn't like. So when someone fears Jehovah God, he looks at these things and he says, you know what? I know these things are not good to do, but by avoiding these things, that benefits me personally. You take, for example, uh, fits of anger. Well, you can see what fits of anger do to people. Just drive on I-4 these days. Interstate 4, that is. I forgot this is broadcast worldwide. So when you're driving on the highway, and when you notice that uh, people are angry, you can see it in their actions. They cut you off. They try to slow down, try to hit you. It's very clear the danger of fits of anger. So someone who fears Jehovah God, he can see the bad consequences of not... Fits of anger. All right. Um, I remember seeing a video on YouTube where... Um, where is it? Where a Jehovah Witness man walks out of the Kingdom Hall and kicks a child sexual abuse sign down the road. Let's have a look. JW kicks sign. Um, no, I don't think we're going to be able to find it. But there's a Jehovah Witness man comes out of the hall and kicks this sign. It's terrible, baby. Not getting away from the things that Job hates. See, that's where fear of God takes on a different definition. Now a person who fears... These people, none of us are immune to these things, okay? We're probably not doing it or anything like that, but none of us are immune, particularly if we think there's something we need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. God, he's principle-minded. He understands God's thinking. So now... He can think of several things like these that God would want to do. No mention of now, the Lord Jesus very, Christ. No uh, mention of the Holy Spirit. Of, of, of a fear of God. It doesn't come naturally. We're not born all of a sudden and we fear and with God. So how did we develop that type of thinking? Now, hang on. I argue that there are a lot of people that have moral. He's talking solely about moral, ladies and gentlemen. This is not a Christian in any way. It's not a Christ-centered message. He's talking about moral standards. You can go to any meeting, positive thinking meeting, and they'll teach you this. There's no Christ-centeredness in this at all. Well, a Christian develops the fear of God by diligently reading and studying God's Word, the Bible. Now, let's look at an example of someone who was instructed to do just that, and that was Joshua. Let's look at Joshua chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. <clears throat> And Joshua, at this time in his life, he had a very heavy responsibility. Moses is dead, and Jehovah has instructed Joshua to be the leader of Israel. But a good leader is one who recognizes his own leader. So notice what his leader gives him with his instructions. So Jehovah tells him, Joshua chapter 1, verse 7, Only be courageous and very strong, and observe carefully 
the entire law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not deviate either from to the right or to the left. Now, what he's doing again, he's gone Old Testament. I hope you understand that this sort of mixed up message is harming people theologically. This is why there's so much religious abuse, so much trouble in religion. This is not a New Testament message. This is not a sound message. This man needs to be taken off the pulpit. So that you may act wisely wherever you go. This book of the law should not depart from your mouth, and you must read in it in an undertone, day and night, in order to observe carefully all that is written in it, for then your way will be successful, and then you will act wisely. Did you know Jehovah pretty much gave Joshua a simple formula as to how he could fear him? The song that we just sung, Listen, Obey, and Be Blessed, you actually see that equation in scriptures. For example, Jehovah told Joshua to listen by looking into God's word in an undertone, reading it day and night. And now, you can read God's word day and night and all the rest of it, but if you're not interpreting it correctly, it's in vain. The whole purpose of this Bible was to lead us to Christ. And if Christ isn't the center of what you're reading and trying to do, you're you're on another level you're not got nothing to do with christianity you're doing something else you're just playing rubik's cube with a very dangerous book and then jehovah told him to obey it not deviating from the left or to the right and finally if he was to do that he'll be blessed he will act wisely and he'll be very successful it's the same for us today when we come here to the meetings when you say right now we're listening when we open god's word the bible when we yeah, but just because they're listening to this bloke doesn't mean he's right. We read the publications. We're taking in instructions. We're understanding the... What have the publications got to do in making this applicable? If you do make this applicable, what have the publications got to do with anything to do with Christ? Nothing. The way God thinks. And then when we leave the Kingdom Hall, we put it into action. We're applying it. We're obeying it. And then as we see how our life turns out, then we can see the blessings. You just look at the sharp contrast from us and people of the world. The problems that they deal oh, with. Oh, come on. Oh, we're better than the people of the world. What a load of nonsense. The way they approach the problems. As a matter of fact, it's the people of the world that are sorting this mess out. The Australian Royal Commission and the commissions across the world sorting out this religious, the evil harm that's coming out of these theologically abusive messages. It's very different from Jehovah's people. And the results are very different also. Oh yeah, don't let's not let's not get mistaken here. There is there is a thing called religious evil. They're trying to measure sociological evil with relig they're not mentioning religious evil. Oh dear God, this is theological abuse viewers at its best. So and the reason why we have that is because like Joshua, he listened, he obeyed, and he was blessed. Let me ask you something. When you apply for a job, when you say one of the, the incentives is the benefits, especially with, with you know, the health situation, if the coronavirus takes off, uh, you're really thinking about health insurance because you want to see a doctor and take care of yourself. So benefits is important. And, with so, and it's good for us as God's people to know the benefits that come with fearing the true God. Now we did an explanation. Now we're gonna see how benefits are welfare. So here's two this guy's benefits got we're going no to talk clue about. of their welfare. He doesn't understand the underlying danger of telling people that there's something they need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. He doesn't know Romans 7, this bloke. He hasn't got a clue. He's not putting the whole thing together. He doesn't know that sin, that it might appear sin, by thinking there's something we need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad, produces death in us through what is good, which is the, the commandments. So that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly <laughs> sinful. They're not, a, they're not got any consciousness of this at all. None whatsoever. They don't understand that when you think there's something you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad, 
you're actually making yourself vulnerable to becoming exceedingly sinful. No clue whatsoever of how dangerous this is. The first one is that godly fear drives out the fear of man. And you notice I said fear two times. No, I don't believe that because when you look at them at the carts, they're running left, right and center. They don't want to talk about the Bible. Godly fear is not the same as fear of man. You know, fear, as we mentioned, is basically a healthy respect for something. Uh, when we say fear of man, we're talk there's a different definition. That's called uh, a phobia or morbidity. This is just a... That's basically like, for example... No different to a university talk. Trying to use, closed doors be used in a religious way. Or fear of man. You be able, you're, you're afraid of showing who you really are, so you kind of freeze. Uh, you see, that's what we're talking about, that fear of man. The, the type of fear that paralyzes you, and you don't make any moves. Well, the, the benefit is that when you have godly fear, it drives out the fear of man, which basically means that, to some degree, we do have a fear of man because we want to, we want to be pleased by our fellow people. But see, godly fear, it pushes it out, detoxes it, so to speak. Now, here's the reason why. Look at Psalm 118, verse, verse 8. Let's Still no Psalm mention of the Lord Jesus Christ. Six. None whatsoever. The attitude that the psalmist has right, is what okay. helps us to appreciate... I think we better stop there at 36 minutes. Um, again, is that a pass or a fail so far? No, it's a fail. It's theological abusive preaching. There's no Christ-centeredness. There's no relying on the Holy Spirit. It's all about what you think you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. So that sin, through the commandment, through those things that he's saying, might become exceedingly sinful. This is Dr. Jason W. Morrison, Theologist, New South Wales, Australia. Bye for now.